Hi, I'm Susan Lewis from WRTI. I'm here with Sharon Isbin to talk about her recent album, Affinity. Hi, Sharon. Hello, Susan. It's great to talk to you again. It's great to talk to you. And this is a beautiful, beautiful album. I think we spoke in 2016 when you were in Philadelphia playing at the Kimmel Center and you had just premiered the Brubeck piece with the Maryland Symphony Orchestra. Yes, that's right. This was in uh, April of 2015 and an exciting concerto that Chris Brubeck wrote for me. He, of course, is the son of Dave Brubeck, whose centennial is being celebrated this December. That's right. And it's, it is a beautiful concerto. All of the pieces on Affinity were written for you. And how and when did you decide to put them together in a recording? Well, it all kind of came together under the concept of works that were, as you mentioned, composed for me and that would be, for the large part, world premieres. So the centerpiece of this, of course, is the 16-minute long concerto that, that Chris wrote for me. And it's inspired by all kinds of wonderful jazz and Middle Eastern idioms and has a, a condensa in it and then this rollicking finish at the end that's very fiery. So. Having done the premiere, of course, made me want to do the recording. And I was able, fortunately, to combine forces with the Maryland Symphony and their wonderful conductor, Elizabeth Scholz, who had conducted the world premiere with me in order to do the recording. So we did that first. Yeah, that was in September of 2018, because that was the only time everybody was available, one day, <laughs> one afternoon that we were all available. And then, I was able in May of 2019 to add the, the other components to the album, which have music from Cuba by Leo Brower and music from China by Tan Dun called Seven Desires for Guitar. There is a lovely duet that is a world premiere uh, by Antonio Lauro with a former student of mine, Colin Davin, and then I also do a beautiful song cycle that was commissioned by Carnegie Hall and the Harris Theater Chicago for me and Isabel Leonard called Of Love and Longing, and it's by Richard Danielpour, and it uses roomy poetry and, and just beautiful uh, song cycle of three, of three works. It is, it is a beautiful album. I've been listening to it, and I don't know what it is about the guitar and, and the way you play it especially that just kind of resonates, it can calm you down, it can make you feel like dancing, it, it really has such versatility and it, especially at this time, it seems like music that you can lose yourself in. Well, it's true. Part of that reason is that the guitar, it's, it's a direct contact. I play with my fingernails, I don't use a pick, rarely, and everything is resonating the wood of the body of the instrument with myself. So there is this sense of intimacy about the instrument. And it, it is really you that you are expressing, of course, and the composer and the music and the, the cosmic energy that surrounds all of that. But there's no, there are no mechanics involved other than the vibrating string and, and the wood. So that sense of intimacy, I really believe transfers in a very personal way to people who are listening to, to the guitar. And there's so many colors that are possible, just an, an infinite variety. If I play by the bridge, it's a very ponticello sound. And as I move forward towards the fingerboard, it becomes more dolce and sensuous. You can finger on the left hand in, off on, up to five different places or even more of a single note, and each one will produce a different quality of sound that is very expressive. I wondered, you mentioned how personal this is and how expressive it is. When you have a composer write something for you, do you work with them so that the final product is kind of a blend of your personal story and, and their own approach to it? Yes, the answer is, for the most part, but in the case of the Brubeck, something very unusual happened that had never happened to me before. When, when Chris started writing the piece, at one point he called me up and he said, would you mind if I drop by to play you some sketches and show you things? And I, I said, sure. So he did. And he said, tell me what you think of it. Is there anything you want me to change? 
I said, you're asking me to critique your music as you're writing it? He said, yes. And I thought, wow, this is somebody who has just not only tremendous integrity, but has a lot of courage, self-confidence, and is willing to be vulnerable in the process of, of his creation like that. So I took him up on the offer and I made some pointers here and there. And the next visit, he came by and he played me a slow section. And I didn't tell him at the time, but I felt it didn't really move me. And I did tell him, however, I said, you know, you've lost your father, Dave Brubeck recently, and your mother. Is, is there any way you'd want to pay tribute to them and maybe even use some of your father's music in a slow section. And he said, and this really surprised me, he said, I am so glad you asked. I was afraid you wanted only my own music. I said, no, Chris, I want you to write what is, whatever is in your heart. So with that, he went back to the drawing board. He sent both me and Elizabeth Schulz, the conductor, three different songs of his father that ni neither of us had ever heard before. And we both said, this one, and it was Autumn by Dave Brubeck, a piece that he had performed with his father a lot, and he then ended up on his own scrapping the whole slow section he'd written, replacing it with this beautiful orchestration of Autumn, and that forms the heart and soul of the piece, surrounded by all of these wonderful virtuosic Middle Eastern and jazz and waltz-like elements that are part of the concerto. Right, and it's so amazing how one style transforms into another, and they all fit together so well. There are no movements. It's all one flowing piece. Well, he was, he was intrigued by the idea that I've, I've worked with people from so many different genres, uh, from rock music like Steve Vai and Nancy Wilson from Heart, jazz people like Stanley Jordan and Romero Lubambo from Bossa Nova Worlds, and Joan Baez in folk. Uh, the list kind of goes on, Mark O'Connor in country fiddle. So he was drawn to something that would be of different genres and that would have kind of a worldview and bring all of that together. Not, of course, tapping on everything, but, but just that concept of bringing through music a, a different kind of vision of the world. And Affinity, the title, is apt. He actually chose that because he knew of my interest in science. I, I, when I was a child, uh, I had started guitar in Italy as a nine-year-old, and when we came back a year later to the United States, my father used to say, you can't launch your rockets until you put in an hour on the guitar. <laughs> and that's how he bribed me to keep practicing. So that interest in science stayed with me all my life. Eventually, it, it shifted to music. And I, I did end up in space uh, when Chris Hadfield, the astronaut from Canada, brought one of my CDs up there. So what Chris, in, in looking up the title Affinity, he saw it as, I'm just going to read it to you, uh, an attraction or force between particles that causes them to combine. So that is a metaphor, not only for my friendship with him, and our affinity for each other, but our affinity for different styles of music, as well as different genres. And all of that comes together in this wonderful concerto. Is that something that you think has been part of you your whole career, that desire to explore different genres? Because I know you started out, uh, I believe we, t we talked earlier about starting out playing a lot of Bach. Yes, I, I had the wonderful opportunity to spend 10 years studying with a great Bach scholar and, and keyboard artist, Rosalind Turek. And I was drawn to having her as a mentor because I had no guitar teacher at the time. I was in college, actually had no teacher from the age of 16 other than during the summer. And I needed desperately guidance on Baroque performance practice and to really change the way Bach was presented on guitar. So that was something very early in my life in terms of the interest in other styles. None of it was ever calculated. I, and, and I would say 99% of the, the cases, it was something that, that came by my way. The door was open and I walked in and <laughs> I, I was invited to, to play with these amazing people. And for me, it always meant saying, 
yes, before I knew I could even do it, but having faith because I had such respect for them as colleagues, as artists, as musicians, as composers, as arrangers, and that I identified so much with their voice that I knew somehow it was going to work. And the same thing happened most recently when I did an album called Strings for Peace, where I had to go into North Indian classical music and I had very little time to do it, but it all evolved from a friendship of 10 years with Amjad Ali Khan, who when he wrote these ragas for me, I, I was just smitten by them and I, I fell in love with the music and ended up touring in India with him in February 2019 and his sons and then producing the album that came out at the same time as Affinity. Wow, wonderful. And the next piece on this album, the Leo Brower, was a gift to you, I understand, after you won the 1975 Toronto guitar competition. Yes, it actually came a bit later than that, but it was um, something that was totally unexpected. I had first heard Leo Brower, who is Cuba's foremost composer and, at the time, guitarist, in Toronto in 75. I had won a competition there and he was performing as part of the festival and I was so enamored of his music that after that point I, I was determined to find everything I could of his. I started recording it, sending him albums. I, I never even brought up the idea of him writing something for me. It hadn't occurred to me that he would consider that. So one day an envelope appeared in the mail and it was this beautiful El de Camaro Negro, which is three ballads based on love stories collected in Africa by a 19th century ethnologist from Germany. So they are descriptive, they're programmatic, they use Afro-Cuban elements, and just so beautiful and painterly in their style. Another work on this album that is just intriguing is the Tendon, Seven Desires for Guitar. Uh, I, the liner notes, I guess, say that it was conceived as a counterpoint of styles. What does that mean? Well, the seven desires reflects the idea of the guitar desiring to be a pipa. Pipa is the ancient Chinese lute, and they play it with plectrums on their fingers. We use our fingernails. They go this way, we go this way, <laughs> and we both share all these wild strums and sort of Jimi Hendrix-like bent notes, but for them it's ghostly evocations when that happens. And Tan Dun is very much inspired by ritual, so you may hear elements of wailing at a funeral or the parade uh, in a march or celebration at a wedding, the very touching elements as well as very powerful ones. And all of this combines together with his desire to unite in spirit and embodiment the ancient Chinese lute pipa with the tradition of the Spanish guitar. And, and, and for him, that vision was flamenco. So you'll hear gestures of flamenco and you'll hear elements that both instruments share that are brought together to create really a third instrument. I had to become a pipa in my playing technique and adapt our normal tremolo, which is thumb AMI, which sustains in a very fast way the melody pitch and do it all as the pipa would do on one string. And it, then it can go on infinitely the, the length of a pitch rather than die out. So all of that was interesting challenges. There are glisses. I coached a lot with Tandun on playing his concerto that he had written for me back in 1996. And this evolved from that. So there is definitely a spiritual community, communion with me and the composer in Seven Desires for Guitar. And, and it reflects also his experience of researching Chinese folk music. He had been banished to the countryside during the Cultural Revolution in China and wasn't allowed to play any Western instruments. So he used sticks and drums and water and, and anything in nature. And all of that later reflected in his music. Wow. It's so interesting when you say the guitar is trying to be like the pipa. I, I gather in your experience, you've commissioned so many works, you've gone into so many different cultures. Uh, you mentioned the strings for peace. Do you constantly find yourself learning new things about this instrument that's been part of you for so long? That's a great question, Susan, because the answer is yes. And sometimes 
I've been asked to do things that I thought, well, this is kind of nuts. How am I going to do this? One example, uh, when Lucas Foss wrote me a concerto, he wanted to imitate the effect of a time, an electronic time delay. So rather than hooking my instrument up to something that would be on a loop, I had to find a way to tap on different parts of the instrument to create a melodic form while I was playing. I figured it out, but again, that was something I didn't know how it was going to happen. John Coriano wanted me, at my own crazy suggestion, to perambulate <laughs> amidst the orchestra while playing this wild, fast run as the piece started as in a dramatic gesture of moving from the, the 13th century of the French troubadours into our world. And I had to pace back and forth in the living room with my guitar hooked up to all kinds of suction cups and things so I didn't have to drill <laughs> into it to see that I could actually move and play at the same time. Um, again, these are, these are the kinds of challenges that are hair pulling at the time, but in the end you feel a sense of, of, of real accomplishment because it has brought yet another dimension to the instrument. Oh, it's great. And it's expanded the repertoire for guitar so much. And it's made people see the guitar and listen to the guitar and think of the guitar in totally new ways. It's really wonderful. And the other pieces on the album on Affinity, the Lauro arranged by Colin Davin and the Daniel Poor are very different themselves. Well, the Laro has a fascinating story behind it. Of course, Natalia, this waltz, is one of Antonio Lauro's most famous. And I happened to be in Caracas, and I was invited to a party, and I was playing. Someone passed me a guitar, and I started playing the waltz Natalia. And who should be there but Natalia herself? And she picked up a quattro, which is a Venezuelan folk guitar. She started improvising all these wonderful chords in a folk style, and I, I was just in heaven. And I thought, wow, I hope someday I can find somebody to make an arrangement of a second guitar part that I can do with them like this. So I began playing duet concerts with a former student of mine, Colin Davin, who is now faculty at the Cleveland Institute of Music. And I said to him, you know, could you do this? Could you write a second guitar part? You're such a great arranger in a folk style that has this element of the quattro to it. And he said, sure. And what he came up with was so beautiful that I invited him to join me on the album for the world premiere recording of it. And the Richard Daniel Poor is different still. Yes, that is kind of a wild story in that Richard was very close to a close friend of mine, Mary Lou Humphrey, who in fact worked with Tandun, wrote the program notes for the Tandun and worked with Richard on his opera market, Garner, as sort of a dramaturg for it, overseeing the whole thing and helping him to shape it. And when she passed away several years ago, Richard was, uh, of course, devastated by that, as was I. So what was really interesting is that I had started playing recitals with Isabel Leonard and I got the message that Carnegie Hall wanted to commission a composer to write something for us that we would then premiere at Carnegie Hall in 2015. Well, the day after learning that and said, that's a great idea, I'll think about it, as to whom, the day after that I get a call from Richard Daniel Poor and I hadn't talked to him in years. We had had no communication, we had, we had known each other years back and he said, Sharon, I've been thinking about you. And he said, I have this desire to write a piece for you and a singer. And I said, well, did you know that Isabel Leonard and I were performing together? He said, no, I had no idea. I said, well, this comes at a really good moment because Carnegie wants to commission something for us. So that's how it happened. And he, he had he already had the piece in his head. He had already selected the roomy poetry. He just needed to reach out to me and say, can I do this for you? And I, again, I can't, I can't speak to how this could possibly have been such a symbiotic, unusual way of coming together, but it did. It's amazing. It's really, um, it seems as if it was meant to be. And, and, it was, and it was dedicated to Mary Lou so that right. this, this album has so many elements 
a friendship and deep connection that it's kind of a, a life journey in some ways. Well, congratulations. And it's, it is a wonderful album. It's unusual time to release an album, I guess. That was not planned. Uh, <laughs> certainly nobody knew back in 2019 that when it would come out to the world in, in the summer of 2020, that, that the world would be in the throes of a pandemic and there'd be all kinds of violence erupting in country after country. So for me, having a way to share music has turned out to be a very important thing because I can't go out and give concerts right now. They're all postponed till who knows when. Uh, and all of that is now being transferred into making this recording something that people can hear no matter where they live. And it, it reminds me in a way of the experience I had that was so transformative back in 2002 when I was invited to perform at the first ever 9-11 memorial at Ground Zero for the 40,000 family members and survivors who had gathered to hear the reading of the names of the near, nearly 3,000 who were lost there. And I wondered how I would be able to hold up in this experience. But the moment I stepped out on stage and people were right up to the stage with the, holding up posters of their lost loved ones and I, I just had the sense I'm on the planet to be part of this healing process. And I've just never forgotten that moment and how that felt. And it, I even referenced it as an encore uh, for the next year and people would come up to me and say, thank you for doing that. I've lost a cousin or a parent or my best friend in 9-11 and it just meant so much to me that the music could be part of that healing process. And, and I think that's what we're all experiencing now as well, a need to find a way to be sustained, to still be inspired, to be empowered, to move forward and to try to change the world for the better because it's in kind of a mess right now. Much needed music. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Sharon. Thank you, Susan. Thanks so much, Sharon Ispin.